everybody, and welcome to the StoryTech Know Before You Go webinar. This is an annual broadcast that StoryTech does prior to CES as a primer to go over some of the trends that will be shaping the next year in content, technology, and marketing. And I have with me a wonderful uh, set of panelists who are all sitting at the center of so many of these trends. And I'm going to introduce them in a moment, but a lot of what we do at CES as StoryTech is we give executive tours. And these executive tours are all about helping people understand the story behind the technology and how that's going to impact consumers and participants over the next year. So it's a really exciting time in our world. A lot of different technologies are coming together. And now we're going to hear from some of the great folks. And of course, I want to thank my sponsor today, Indigo, Indiegogo Enterprise, who is going to be our partner at CES this year. And of course, um, one of our panelists is from Indiegogo, and that's Matt Johnson. And Matt, you see in the um, upper left corner there. And Matt is the VP of Strategy and Innovation at Indiegogo Enterprise. And then on the bottom left corner, I feel like this is Hollywood Squares. <laughs> we have Mark Rochelle, who is from Canary. And Canary is a, a social reputation management company. And he's going to dig into some of the trends surrounding millennials this year. And then we have the lovely Anne-Marie Stefan, who is from Koala. And she is an expert in the future of retail and what's happening around retail innovation. So these are all trends that are really popping up and exploding in our ecosystem today. And so we're gonna jump into the first trend, which is really all about the new face of innovation and how do large corporations move through and stop from being disrupted. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Matt, who is gonna take us through some of the things that Indiegogo Enterprise are doing to help large corporations innovate. Yeah, thanks, Lori. And uh, we're really excited about the StoryTech partnership, so much of what's happened over the last couple of years at Indiegogo has been about the future of crowd-powered innovation at scale. Uh, not just, you know, Indiegogo is 10 years old. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary in 2018, and CES is really a nice opportunity for us to enjoy that. And looking back, crowd, crowdfunding has been often about small entrepreneurs who are bringing their ideas in to market in ways that they couldn't get funding for if crowdfunding didn't exist. But the future of crowdfunding uh, appears to be looking very different than that. So at Indiegogo, at CES two years ago, we announced Indiegogo Enterprise. And since then, we've worked with dozens of the world's largest organizations and really the entrepreneurs within them to be able to bring innovation to market in a way that isn't as much about funding. Uh, large organizations aren't partnering with Indiegogo because they need cash. It's about the kind of difference, the, the quality of innovation when you are deeply connected to what matters to people. Very early, when you are co-creating with a community, it produces a fundamentally different kind of product. And for a lot of organizations, you know, they've got these massive lockers of intellectual property and of products that they're considering, many of which never make it to the see the light of day, only because the, 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 the antibodies inside these large organizations are set up to kill things that might look risky. But over the last couple of years, as many people who work in large organizations know, the language of startups has made its way into you know, the halls of Procter & Gamble. They're talking about minimum viable products. They're talking about rapid iterations. They're talking about the startup way. And you know, Indiegogo is looking at how we can partner with entrepreneurs inside large organizations to take a different approach to corporate innovation, where it's not market research, market research, market research, focus group, focus group, but rather, you know, iterate and bring it to the crowd and get validation and get a community of raving fans that are going to tell you what's working and tell you what's not working. And it's really beginning to alter the way large companies are thinking about the products they bring to market. So, you know, just to give a sense of what that's going to be like on the show floor at CES, in addition to the almost 300 entrepreneurs that are exhibiting at CES that are the smaller entrepreneurs who've raised you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for their products. 
Uh, we're going to have Procter & Gamble and Bose and Honeywell and companies that are taking startup teams inside large organizations and really finding new ways to bring innovative things to market. P&G's profiling a uh, Internet of Things device for the home that is fragrance for the home. It's an app-driven Procter & Gamble device that delivers, uses inkjet technology to be able to deliver, you know, the Febreze solution along with premium smell and aromatic device, uh, the, the, the inserts that you can put in the device and be able to control the ambiance of your house in a new way. And that kind of thinking might not have made it out of the innovation lab. So we're just seeing new approaches to the way companies are bringing products to market. And we think it's an exciting time for partnership between large organizations and startups. And the way uh, at Indiegogo that we're embracing not just perks-based crowdfunding, but also equity-based crowdfunding. And we're seeing a lot of new models for how innovation is getting funded and sometimes that looks like, hey, let me bring, let me pre-launch this product and see if I can get pre-orders. Sometimes it looks like, let me accelerate this startup and like co-invest with the crowd in an equity campaign or even an initial coin offering, which is something Indiegogo announced last week. So that's just some of the, the new models of innovation that we're seeing for large organizations. That is very exciting. Uh, so uh, what I wanted to do now is just see if anyone on the panel had um, had a question for Matt. W one thing that I always hear about when uh, large corporations are trying to innovate is that there's often a conflict between that innovation team that's in one silo, the marketing team in another silo, the research team in another silo, and so things never leave. Um, is Indiegogo Enterprise helping to create synergies within a corporation that has so many different silos? Yeah, part of the, it's a great question. So part of the benefit, you know, with a, with a company like um, Whirlpool that had for 15 years had technology for chewable ice, which is like what you can get at the Sonic restaurants. It's, it's like better, it makes the drinks colder faster, people like to chew it. And they would knock on the, the head of R&D would knock on the door of the head of sales and say, hey, people want this, I think. And the head of sales would say, don't touch my, you know, appliances, please. Uh, thank you very much. And GE and would say, no, no, thank you. We're not going to put it in our refrigerators. No, thank you. No, thank you. And this went on year after year after year. But with Indiegogo, the team could go a little bit rogue. And that's what it felt like when they did it. What happened was they launched something that, had never been done before, which is a stand, a, a countertop device that had chewable ice and raised uh, $600,000 and got, you know, hundreds of clients. And then it's a whole different kind of conversation in large organizations. So part of what Indiegogo makes available is a kind of market validation that you can do things that alter the kinds of conversations that you could have. I would say the one other piece that may be a little bit more subtle, and this is something I'm really just so excited about the, the moment we're in, not just with large organizations, but entrepreneurship everywhere. There's a kind of uh, courage that's required to try to do something. And uh, I think large companies have not been set up to encourage that kind of behavior. We, we've been thinking about it like a moonshot. You might hear that Google talks about moonshots and you hear it from time to time, we're really about moonshots by the millions. That what does it take for an entrepreneur inside a large organization to say, this is a good idea, I wanna plant a flag here, I wanna try this. That's really a lot of what you're gonna see from Indiegogo and Indiegogo Enterprise is how can we empower that kind of like moment by moment leadership that this is a product that deserves to live and you know, remove the kinds of obstacles to be able to get to market validation faster. I'm excited by that. Yeah, it's very exciting. I'm actually really excited to get to Eureka Park this year, which is in the sands. Yeah. It's the bottom floor and that's where all the startups are. And of course, Indiegogo has a huge presence there this year with all their great partners doing really wonderful things. So it'll be really exciting to see what you're up to there. We're going to jump over now to, to talk about another trend, which is called New World Citizens, Millennials Make the Mold. And this is really all about um, not, not only millennials changing marketing or complaining about how they behave, um, 
but more about how they are emerging as the largest block in the in the workforce how that is impacting the globe, um, how they see themselves as world citizens. And so we're gonna jump over to Mark Rochelle, who is the director of account solutions at Canary. And Canary is a fantastic um, social reputation management company. Mark's gonna talk all about what they do and also help us understand how social is really impacting this up and coming generation. So I'm going to spotlight over to Mark. Take us away, Mark. Uh, thank you so much, and it's uh, it's great to be here. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting time we find for millennials. From a reputation standpoint, um, when it comes to social media, um, it's been really interesting for us to track because, you know, we're millennials in general are at kind of an interesting time in their careers right now, where uh, some of them at this point have had some success. Um, and, you know, what they've done to get to this point in their career is not really what they need to do to get to the next level. Um, so be using social media professionally and actually thinking about your online reputation um, and actual thought leadership has become increasingly important, not only for, you know, already established senior executives, but even the mid-level uh, professional and executive who's really looking to accelerate their career and get to the next level. Um, now, the interesting thing about millennials are is they are kind of digital natives, um, but at the same time, a lot of them have lived half their lives without social. Uh, so there's a kind of a unique viewpoint where, you know, they're, they're very comfortable and natural using social media, but they also get very nostalgic for the past. Um, and sometimes that holds them back from really leveraging, I think, social media in a professional way. Um, so what we've done at Canary and some of the things we found interesting is we did this white paper this year in 2017 that really outlined executive use of social media um, and how it's perceived. Um, and the interesting thing here is that over the past few years, uh, previously, you know, it was not as, it was not seen as important for executives or professionals to really use social media to build their personal brand. In fact, sometimes even, you know, a few years ago, it was looked at, almost looked down upon. Um, now it's become, it seems like it's become increasingly important. And again, not only for, you know, an established executive who's considered very senior, but for the mid-level, uh, you know, senior, maybe senior executive or mid-level professional. Um, and so I also want to introduce my colleague, Anna, here, by the way, who's also working closely with me on the team. And she's also a millennial. And so she could also certainly talk to some of the trends about millennials' use of social media um, and how it's kind of changing and, and how the landscape's changing in 2017. So anything that you want to elaborate on, Anna, and then I can go through some statistics about what we found in our white paper. Sure. Go right ahead. I love the age of generation relationship millennials have with social media because the first concern when it comes to it is always, will this affect my ability to be hired, right? That's something that we've been used to hearing from day one is this idea of, can my presence actually hurt me? And of course that's true, any public presence can hurt or help you. So that's what we're kind of trying to see. And we're starting to see that flip is understanding that it's significant, it's influential, and depending on the presence you put out there, it will either push you forward or maybe hinder you in one way or another. So we really work with people in terms of how do you hone that voice? How do you empower yourself through social channels? And especially now we're seeing this take on a whole new life as Mark mentioned, it's coming to the point where there's eventually a point in your career where you need it, where it becomes something that actually pushes you forward because it's about influence at the end of the day. It's about your ability to understand what's going on and to speak and resonate with a really uh, big group of people with a relevant market. And we're seeing this both happen on an individual professional level, as Mark mentioned, the mid-levels are really starting to embrace this and it's becoming a huge moment for them, but also for different approaches and how brands communicate. I think when it comes to, I know we mentioned with Indiegogo, CES, um, 
this is huge, right? We kind of almost live stream our lives for lack of a better term, but it really does become this whole, like this is where I communicate. The new town center is your internet browser. So when it comes to any activation, it becomes increasingly important to have a social presence and have that narrative be told in a, in a cohesive way. I love that. I love that town center uh, analogy. Um, you want to take us through a few quick uh, data points before we go on to the next trend? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we in the white paper that we did this year, um, we found some interesting things. So we found that, you know, and, and this may, these stats may seem almost obvious now, but they have, were vastly different a few years ago when we did this white paper. So what we found now is when we did, when we interviewed and did a survey of 500 executives, uh, we found that 52% of employees are inspired by their social, socially active executives, which, you know, nowadays it seems like you want your executives to be active and social so that you can highlight the key initiatives of the company and be more transparent. But a few years ago, that was not the case. Um, it was it was drastically different. Um, we found that 63% of executives uh, make public comments um, about about the company um, tends to help the company and the employees, and not only in, in terms of retaining employees, but also recruiting new employees. So um, it's really a great tool to also have your executives be obviously the key stakeholders of the company to help not only retain talent, but recruit talent, which is, you know, become increasingly hard uh, for a lot of companies now. And the other big thing that we, we found is that individual and uh, professional content done through the individual is actually tends to get at least eight times more engagement than from a brand. And that's an interesting thing because, uh, you know, people inherently nowadays, they, they just don't always trust brands as much and they're not as likely to engage with a brand on social as they are a key executive um, because we find that it just comes off more genuine and authentic. Uh, so it's been uh, much, it seems to have been much more powerful for the executives and even the employees of a company to actually have a voice on, on social media around the two to three kind of core topics they want to be known for and keeping that focus. And that's kind of been the most powerful. Wow. Um, I just wanted to um, toss it out to the, to the group here and see if uh, anybody had any questions because I know millennials are a big conversation for all of us as we try and, and engage. Um, and maybe just a question to tie together our conversations with um, Indiegogo, but are millennials really interested and excited about participating with startups? Yeah, so I think uh, the, it's not just participating with startups. I, I think that might have been an assumption that would have been really easy to make given the way the world of crowdfunding has evolved over time, that there's a preference for being able to work with something that's small or that is startup. I think what's being revealed is that millennials and in general people have less and less tolerance for sort of inauthentic behavior from businesses and that what's attractive is to be a participant and to be not just a participant like I'll tweet about it or I won't tweet about it like that might have been the beginning of it but you know atoms are the new bits we're really looking at the impact of social on innovation not just media, but the you know, multi-trillion dollar markets for the mm -hmm. way things are made in the world. And so I think there's a real hunger to be able to have products reflect what I care about, what matters to me. And I think that's something that you know, large organizations or small organizations sort of ignore at their peril. So I think it's a very impactful push by millennials to start being an active participant in social innovation. Yeah, and it's actually interesting because you're seeing as much as as uh, brand averse as this generation is, they're also the most interested in branding themselves. Yeah. So brands that are doing super well, they're doing the service of my association with you says something about you. So something about the type, type of content you're into or the uh, philanthropies that really empower you or more importantly now, especially for us, like we mentioned is it's changed how we communicate. It's kind of the really the main way that we contact one another now that 
you know, memes are even a way of communicating brands who kind of can engage an imitative voice in that way that's playful and funny and smart within 20 words. Like that says a lot. And I think when it comes to how people are consuming content, we are so connected at scale, at distance. And so it kind of really does impact, you know, how do we keep this going? How do we keep brands excited and, and uh, communicating in a way that's modern and that makes sense? That's I think exciting. that's why our generation is so excited by startups is because it does kind of put more power in your reins. It's not your typical hierarchy. There's a more democratized sense in labor, but that just shows you that, that we really do see that even that's the importance of having executives that are very open and public facing and it's easy to talk to them as there isn't that traditional wall anymore. I, I love um, how all of these trends also are circling around each other. And now we want to get to another trend that we're looking at, which is what's happening with retail. And so this trend is called retail reinvented tech takes over your wallet. And we have the ever so fabulous Anne-Marie Stefan, who is with Koala. And Anne-Marie is just an expert in the future of retail. So Anne-Marie, take us through some of the things that are happening. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Lori. I, I was uh, trying to save my voice a little bit. I got a little struck last Spilkes. night. Spilkes. <laughs> I didn't want to lose this, uh, so I'm, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to be here because, uh, yeah, retail's a hot spot, and certainly Indiegogo knows that, Canary knows that, that everyone's trying to reinvent retail, right? And it's probably been the most visibly disrupted outside of some of the others that got hit first, music industry, journalism, you know, to name a few. But uh, in retail, it's a pretty dynamic space. So uh, with regards to CES, you know, what we do and what I do is, you know, I see this happening. And you guys have said so many relevant things when you look about um, um, how things are bleeding over into each other, right? So uh, what I created and what we will be doing at CES is this little number here, if you can see it turns out right i'm not sure if it's backwards but yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but you'll see the logo retail innovation lounge and i created it um with the sole intent of, of doing something different right and facilitating conversation so my experience is in startups and innovation uh for many years and you know really the end users want to learn um, and the technology companies hold that information. So what we do is create a platform at the Retail Innovation Lounge that is you know, non-traditional, that it's more immersive so we can facilitate those conversations. So what I look at is, you know, I like to be provocative and say you know, the sales pitch is dead to echo some of the comments here, right? So when the sales pitch ends up in, you know, I'm gonna buy, you know, I'm gonna make you money, I'm gonna save you money, but really what we need is a conversation. Retailers and brands, this is not exclusive to retailers, it's really, uh, it's really cross industry to be to be quite frank, but we'll, we'll focus on retailers and brands that um, you know they're eager to learn, but they don't want to be pitched to anymore. Just like the uh, millennial conversation we had, the culture has shifted. So as our culture and consumer culture has shifted, our B two B culture has shifted. So in the retail innovation lounge, we'll be at the um, LVCC South Hall. This is our first year we've been invited in. So we uh, I think I mentioned we launched at South by Southwest last year and we continue to grow. This will be our fifth uh, production of the Retail Innovation Lounge. We've been going around the country. And what we do at the Retail Innovation Lounge, in addition to bringing relevant people together, right, there's three things people really want. They want to connect with people who have similar challenges to themselves, right? They want to meet their network and their community of innovators, uh, w whichever side uh, they're on. They no longer want to be pitched to and they really want to get under the hood of what these things are, right? So we know there's a see of all of these things out there that can help our businesses. But, you know, in a big show like CES, um, you know, it's, it's hard to identify where are you supposed to go. So what we do in these larger environments is we create a home for like-minded individuals to come together, right, and to learn and get under the hood. And that's really where we want to, want to be, you know. So, um, yeah, so it's very exciting. So what we do in the retail space is facilitate those conversations through content and immersive interaction with the technologies. We don't do booze, we don't do any of that stuff. I'm not into it uh, because I really believe we want to make, you know, break down the walls, which is what social does to a degree, right? When you, both of you guys touched on that earlier with the new logo and canary is that we want to break
break down those walls. We want to facilitate a conversation that is authentic and real. And I think, you know, when you eliminate the barrier, the physical barrier, and really create a value in an educational conversation, that's really what we do at the Retail Innovation Lab. So we let the technologies be there present so that the end users can explore and learn and have a, a one-on-one -on -one conversation that's under the hood a little bit, right? So um, we have some awesome technologies that are going to be there demoing. We feel like we keep adding another super awesome one every day, but mm -hmm. we'll have, um, let me just give you a quick taste of what we're going to be offering. So we will be doing content. So we'll be announcing our speakers next week. It's just super exciting. Uh, and then we'll uh, be featuring technologies like Perch Interactive, which is a pro projection oh, yeah. interactive technology. Oh. All right, welcome oh, aboard. I just wanted right. to, uh, to welcome our, our, uh, our additional speaker who is having some, some challenges technology-wise. And this is Ed Knudsen, who is with Canoe Ventures. And we're, gonna, we're still working on um, talking about retail, but we're going to jump over to Ed next. So keep going, Amory. Stay tuned, Ed. Stay tuned. <laughs> Um, but I was just showcasing, wanted to share um, some of the solutions that we're going to have on board. So we have Perch Interactive, which is an interact, I love this, it's a projection-based interactive technology for basically merchandising, so reinventing the space that integrates data and social information, so you can really get some product information live with a visual aspect to it. Uh, we have Momi, which is an interactive mirror, which is a virtual try-on mirror, where you can also socialize your uh, outfits with your with your community of, of friends uh, in the social world. We have outer nets, which is another projection mapping, but this one uh, projects onto any any surface. Uh, window particularly is what we're looking at, really uh, finding a new digital out of home experience where you can directly uh, engage and uh, transact. So that's a pretty hot one. Quick, which is an uh, Israeli-based um, company, which is super exciting. So basically what they're doing is an IoT button that is direct for brands. This is very disruptive uh, because now brands can own uh, their their button experience, their IoT experience. So we, we're lo looking forward to having them. We have TraxPoint, which is a new, another Israeli, Israel's blowing it up uh, in the uh, software and uh, space. So they have a computer vision uh, shopping cart. So we're gonna have them uh, on site. And we have Supa, which is a uh, sensor. So they're really looking at, uh, they work with a lot of big brands, reinventing apparel and thinking about it as a data platform. Uh, and then USA Technologies, we're touching on payment because payment, you certainly cannot <coughs> have a shopping experience without payment, right? We actually want to go to a sale and to ROI. And lastly, uh, Kinomo, which is a 3D hologram, which you, some of you might have seen already, but we're excited to have them in our space to really continue that conversation of how a hologram can actually be interactive and drive a sales ROI. Because at the end of the day, what a retailer or brand wants is we want that consumer not only to engage and have a relationship with our brand, but we also we want them to buy at the end of the day. So, so we're uh, thrilled to be at CES for our first time this year. And then after that, you'll find us at South by Southwest uh, and some other shows um, throughout the year. That's fantastic. Well, um, I wanted to also, um, we're gonna get to Ed in a second and talk about another trend, but I just wanted to ask, um, to ask our panel you know, um, how you guys are being impacted by the future of retail. And if you see some synergies um, in any of your businesses as, as retail evolves and explodes as Amory laid out. I mean, I think for, for us, we're just seeing a huge e-com play. And I think it really shows you again, the way that we're shifting conversation. I think, you know, we've been hearing so much about OTT, cord cutting, cord nevers, those kinds of things. It really just shows you that the digital is kind of a key platform here and retail is embracing that. If you look at the types of advertising when it comes to things like t-commerce or engageable ads, um, and even things like when you have Instagram, right? The amount of fashion brands that have launched on Instagram and that have retail within and how they kind of like use those social platforms to I have that and it's not a brick and mortar, mortar kind of a approach anymore. I think that's really how you're seeing retail evolve where 
you don't have to try on the clothes anymore as the clothes comes to your door, you know? So I think- I'd like to echo that. I think you're 100% right. And I, and I, I like to be slightly provocative because it's fun. Um, but <laughs> uh, you know, I like to say the word retail itself is antiquated, right? Because the word we understand, the fact of the matter is we live in a convergent world and that's really the world I like to operate in, right? Media, you guys touch on it, media, entertainment, social. A social media influencer can now have have their, and I've seen it, their own pop-up store with their own merchandise, with their own audience, and they're driving huge, huge sales, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit what I like to call, it's a, you know, it's death by a thousand paper cuts for traditional retail, right? PNG, whomever it is, right, Matt? They can go direct to their consumers. Why wouldn't you want to control your own message and your own relationships? Technology is the enabler of that. So, and they're doing it in, you know, across media, entertainment, social, uh, you know, physical brick and mortar. You know, Alibaba's launching physical pop up stores. We could go on and on. But for example, of one of the pure plays that has gone to a brick and mortar environment. So it's really a, a tremendously convergent world. And so we really like to focus on, I do, on the you know, really the uh, emphasis being convergent commerce. Right. Yeah, you're definitely seeing it flip almost where the rebirth of small businesses, you can really see spoken to through social media in terms of both to Anne Marie's point, you know, the influencer play, right? The fact that I can build my own brand and then have a marketable good off of that, but also from brands that they themselves launch that way and they have a whole different strategy. And then on the reverse, you see these huge giant like tech based companies turning into like brick and motor shops and like doing it for the, again, engagement play. It's always about engagement. M Matt, do you have any uh, input on the retail side of things? Yeah, I think it's, I think we've got, we, we mean something when we say retail. You know, if I say the word, I have some idea of what that means. Um, but I think a lot of what's, the, the internet is the great disintermediator. It's been disintermediating industry after industry after industry. I think one way to talk about it is the way we discover what matters to us has changed profoundly. Mm -hmm. you know, part of that is the volume of things I got to deal with. The days are gone when I open up my mailbox and, you know, like, sort through catalogs to discover what, what matters to me. And TV Guide broke at 100 channels, you know, if I want to discover what matters to me. So the question is like, where are people discovering what matters to them? And the answer is, um, in one word, it's Facebook, right? One out of every six minutes spent online is spent on Facebook. But more impactfully, it's that without that signal of what matters to the early adopters in my life, I can't make sense of all this volume of choices I have. So I think when we talk about the future of retail, I'm just so excited, you know, advertising is the tax you pay for being unremarkable. Like we have to do remarkable things. And I'm inspired by all the ways that leaders in large and small companies are thinking about how they can begin to do things that empower the consumers they're serving to speak about it, literally to remark about it. And so I, I, you know, it's not just like, hey, tweet this, but how are we getting them into experiences, into communities that really are natural, that are part of a self-expression? So when I think about the future of retail, I really think a lot about the future of remarkable experiences around businesses and brands. I love that. And um, as we're talking about Facebook and other platforms that reach out and communicate to people. We're going to jump over now to our last but not least panelist, Ed, who um, had some issues. Um, I'm sure it was my fault, Ed, but, <laughs> but I'm so glad you're here. Ed is from Canoe Ventures, which is a technology company that works with all the cable codes and satellite codes and now um, OTT companies to you know, create advertising solutions across all of these different on-demand platforms. And so we have another trend called Beyond the, S the Screen's 21st Century Content, which is all really about all the massive changes happening in content experiences in the screen and all these different technologies coming together to create really um, unique content experiences for different audiences. So Ed, I know you have some great things to share about what you're learning with on-demand behaviors, especially in broadcast environments. So ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, Ed from Canoe Ventures. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Uh, how's the sound? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you great. All right. Yeah, sorry about the glitch there. It, uh, I actually had to join as a, a participant 
and then the uh, support group quickly promoted me to uh, panelists. So oh, okay, great. I've got a promotion today, and I've got that going for me. So we feel honored. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, the the trend I want to talk about, uh, I think, might be a little bit counterintuitive and, and counter to what we're hearing, and, and, the, and that is that we're actually seeing an, an increase of uh, video consumption on big screens in the living room. And I know, you know, what we hear day in and day out is, uh, boy, people, there's more and more channels to watch, uh, or more and more distribution channels to watch video programming, there's more content, there's more devices. Um, all that is true, uh, but we're in the video on demand business. And, and in fact, the call it old school cable satellite video on demand business. Uh, at Canoe, we, we sit between uh, three big cable companies, our owners, Comcast, Charter, and Cox, and about 100 uh, broadcasters, programmers, networks, um, who have a need to create new advertising inventory when they put their content into video on demand. So for example, uh, if tonight you happen to miss uh, Hawaii Five-0 on CBS, and you want to pick it up next week, when you watch it next week on demand, um, all the advertising slots that uh, originally aired or that were part of the original broadcast uh, will have new advertising in, in it. So, and we dynamically insert those ads um, uh, by deciding from a, a huge playlist of, of content, different ads that we could, could position in those slots. Um, and the reason we see the trend is this, um, uh, there, each, each of those 30, you know, call it a half hour program, has typically three different um, advertising slots, a pre-roll, a mid-roll, and a post-roll. And each one of those slots has, you know, two or three ads in it. Each time a customer watches that ad, we count that as an impression. And so this year, we're, we're tracking toward a little over 22 billion impressions. Wow. So that may not sound that impressive if you're in the digital video business, online, IP, networks, things like that. But for a traditional uh, cable uh, plants or a cable system, that's a lot of impressions. That's, and, and, and we have seen that over the last four years, we see more and more uh, impressions being generated. And it's a combination of more content being placed on demand, as well as more customers you know, finding that content and having tools at their disposal to make it easier to find that content. Um, and, and so, yes, I mean, there's, you know, video content is becoming more and more available across multiple devices, multiple distribution channels, but viewing a high quality signal on a big screen in your living room is still very, very strong. And we anticipate that, that will continue to be strong for the foreseeable future. Well, I wanted to ask uh, the rest of the panelists, um, you know, because broadcast media is always getting beaten up these days, um, but, but Ed's filling us in that, that that's kind of a lie. So just from your perspectives, from maybe the retail perspective, the millennial perspective, and even um, corporate innovation perspective, how are you guys playing with broadcast? And does what Ed's talking about make sense? Because it is counterintuitive, but the data speaks for itself, right? Anybody have any broadcast media, um, you know? Well, I think from the millennial standpoint, it really, there's only one rule and that's content is king. So whether it's broadcast or a non-traditional thing like a YouTube sensation or whatever, our generation really doesn't delineate that, I don't think. I don't think that they care whether it's broadcast or not, as long as it's a program that they identify with. Like, I think that at the end of the day, they'll put up with ads, they'll put up with a time. If it's something that they genuinely care about and something that they identify with, like if, if it's on brand for them, they'll show up. Yeah, and I would say to add to that on the retail perspective and purchasing perspective, it's we're gonna see a much more fluid experience and that's what we're working toward. So Amazon Studios is no accident, right? So they are learning each business very successfully. So the way I see it, for example, is that Amazon is building loyalty around quality content. We now don't think of anything unusual with an, you know Amazon producing high caliber movies, tier tier A movies and sitting at the front row of the Golden Globes or the Oscars, right? So in the next piece in the background, they've been quietly learning, 
not maybe not so quietly learning the apparel business, for example. And now the next thing that's going to happen after that, imagine you see your favorite actress, Meryl Streep, whoever it is, Jennifer Lawrence, wearing a Dolce & Gabbana gown. And now you're just going to be able to seamlessly either gesture toward it, voice, use your Alexa. Yay. Tell Alexa and ask, <laughs> oh, I'm going to activate Alexa now. But, you know, <laughs> ask her, you know, what is she wearing? Oh, it's Dolce & Gabbana, blue dress, you know, blah, blah. Fantastic. And we also offer private label, Amazon private label at, you know, Sorry, half the price. Your Echo Dot lost its connection. <laughs> Alexa got activated. I apologize. <laughs> she's so, she's so she nosy. to be a part of it. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, that could be applied to OTT, for example. It's going to be a seamless click-through, frictionless experience that feels authentic, right? And connected to something I care about. They even have apps now that allow you to engage with content on social media in a way that lets you identify the brand, right? Like I see a picture, this influencer is wearing something super cool. Sometimes they'll tag the brands directly in it. And it's an interesting inverse relationship because now you're seeing influencers reach out for these opportunities and brands responding naturally, kind of like not to kind of bring up pop culture, but Cardi B and Steve Madden. She definitely facilitated that sponsorship for herself. But there's also from like a consumer standpoint, there's now apps that I can have it running while I'm on Instagram. And if I tap a photo, it'll tell me where to go to buy whatever that piece is. So just kind of speaking to what you were saying is that you're right, it is about loyalty. I think retail is really trying to facilitate the easiest way of me just Anytime I see what's important to me, anytime that I'm curious, it should be one click away from me being able to purchase it, right? Okay, Ed, are you also playing with um, the Amazons and some of these other upstarts um, in content that are really making a big footprint? Are you creating partnerships with them as well? Uh, we, we aren't. Uh, again, we're, we're kind of charged with making sure everything continues to operate in the traditional cable, cable VOD environment sitting between cable operators and programmers. Um, but what we're seeing them doing is, is starting to talk about partnerships like that. I mean, you, you know, if you have, uh, for example, Comcast at home, it's now as easy to, uh, to watch something on Netflix as it, as it is any other channel. I mean, they're so tightly integrated with the interface. Um, and we, we anticipate that we'll see more and more of that. So the line between what was traditional cable or satellite or telco and IP is blurring very quickly. Uh, and so, and that's good for, for everybody because now not only can you sit in your, you know, through your mobile device or on your PC, you know, we're very used to seeing ads that are, that are relevant to what we're, what we're doing or what we're watching. In the cable world, it's still a, a broadcast environment. It's still, stuff is still pushed to us and they're hoping to get people that um, fit within that brand. So um, in the future, though, I think we'll see more addressability with those traditional networks. Oh, things are all colliding. Matt, do um, you want to finish out the topic before we do our last rapid fire question? Certainly. I'm just so connected to the age we live in is really the age of empowered people. Like so many of the things we're talking about is what's happening to empower people. Uber is empowering people. Airbnb is empowering people. And that the volume of content and options really again underlines where is it that I discover what matters to me and that I guess just from Indiegogo's perspective what's exciting because even in content we have some of the great content winners the last couple of years have been funded on Indiegogo. Indiegogo actually started in some ways 10 years ago because it was impossible to get your independent film funded in 2008. The world was falling apart. And how do you empower people to be able to have a say in what matters to them? How do you democratize funding? You know, like when, when startups go to venture capital, 5% of venture funded startups are women run. At Indiegogo, that's 47% of projects or women run and even in very male dominated categories like tech and innovation we're still 27 percent of our projects are women run that's really the impact of the impact of democratized funding democratized decision making so when i think about the future of content like whatever it is the underlying question is 
how are people discovering what matters to them? And the further that content companies or electronics manufacturers or anybody else gets from doing what matters to people, the harder and harder and harder it is to make a business. That's a, a big thought and a great thought. Um, so we're gonna do a rapid fire session now, just go down the line, um, I guess Brady Bunch style <laughs> in these boxes, but I wanted to ask all of you, what are you most looking forward to, to see at CES just personally, and then maybe just uh, close it with uh, where we can learn more about your company. So let's start with you, Matt. What are you personally most looking forward to? I'm, uh, this may be an odd answer, but I'm suspicious that blockchain enabled technologies uh, matter very, very much. And uh, like on a scale that I think might be hard to overstate how impactful they're going to be. And we're at that stage where we're sort of talking about the internet, you know, like what's the internet going to be? And there's like a Netscape that is the, was a hot browser of the moment. And that's sort of the moment we're in where Bitcoin is just the Netscape of blockchain. But the future of blockchain enabled content management decision-making, voting, technology, it really, we're just at the very early stages. And I'm sort of excited to see what might just be coming out of someone's garage about that. So, so that's personally, I think, a very exciting. I think also where so many technologies are making it easier for people to build and make. You know, if I said to you, there are th three, three women in a dorm room are starting a social network, you'd be like, great, yep, that's great. But three women in a dorm room are starting a car company. We're seeing that kind of power out of the tools. And just to underline, I think what's possible at Indiegogo, you know, we got 10 years of celebrating entrepreneurship, uh, you know, being at Eureka Park and really celebrating that. Hundreds of entrepreneurs there who have been empowered at Indiegogo and really be beginning to talk about what the next 10 years are gonna be like uh, I think we want to be the innovation partner for small entrepreneurs and large entrepreneurs. And we're just so excited to connect with people that are ready to build what's next. So that, that's what there is, is to visit us at Eureka Park at CES. Fantastic. Uh, Mark what, and Anna, what's happening? Yeah. Uh, what, what's, what are you most excited about? So I certainly agree with Matt about blockchain. That's probably one of the most exciting things. I mean, from a reputation standpoint, we're thinking about that because of the idea of validating someone's reputation on the blockchain, right? And that's something that we're thinking about and how that can play a role in the future to ensure that someone's reputation that you find online is actually true and it's really that. Um, so that's definitely something. And then just in general, I mean, CES has been really, really important for us each year uh, and for the clients that we work with. So future of retail, of course, uh, driving autonomous driving and technologies that are coming out in the automotive uh, industry have been really, really uh, interesting to follow as well. So those are some of the things that we're, we're tracking and uh, cer certainly the blockchain because I think it's hard to ignore that. So. Um, and we're gonna, we'll be able to uh, find out more at uh, canary.com? Yes. Canary.com, Q-N-A-R-Y.com. You can find our white paper there on executive use of social media as well, so. Great, thank you so much. Um, Ed from uh, Canoe Ventures, what, what are you most looking forward to? Boy, I, can't, I couldn't agree with Matt Moore. Um, um, blockchain from our perspective is gonna be a, a big part of the conversation at CES, I think. Uh, data is everything, and we sit in an environment <clears throat> where cable operators are literally sitting on mountains and mountains of data, uh, consumer data that could be utilized in really cool ways, uh, utilized responsibly. And I think blockchain is, is going to uh, enable that uh, for the first time. I think there'll be some other cool conversations going on, a lot of buzz around net neutrality, neutrality um, yeah. and, and the recent developments there. I think a lot of people will be talking about that. Yeah, I think people are angry about that, but that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> some people are angry, some people aren't. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I guess where you're sitting, that's true. Um, and we can find out more at canoeventures.com? Canoeventures.com, yep. Or uh, just watch video on demand tonight, and when the commercial comes up, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and let's, let's close it out with Anne-Marie. What are you most excited about at CES this year? 
You know, I think um, I, I'm going to get on the blockchain, you know, bandwagon, just comment on that because it is disrupting. It will be the disruptor of every, in, of every industry in the biggest wave of the next thing that we're, we're going to see, you know, in my opinion. Uh, so it will impact, you know, uh, just every industry. So it's a really powerful tool. Um, but, but to uh, uh, also echo the autonomous vehicle, um, uh, from a less less sexy perspective, but we just saw PepsiCo made the largest pre-order purchase of the Tesla, um, you know, uh, uh, semis. And I think that and that follows, you know, Walmart and several other brands. And I think that's really powerful stuff when we look at the autonomous vehicles, because not as sexy blockchain, you know, is sort of, you know, at its surface a little bit not as sexy but it is kind of sexy for tech geeks right yeah. uh, very sexy but you know supply chain and logistics are not sexy but they are the backbone of what's going to really be impacted um, by all of what we just discussed around how consumers purchase where they purchase how they purchase uh, so supply chain and logistics is though not sexy is a big uh, piece of the retail backbone retail and brand backbone so i think autonomous vehicles and of course i want to see what's happening in home you know because that's yeah. really the biggest shopping center it's uh, right. uh, still evolving through iot so. So. And Amory, where can we learn more about what Koala is doing? Sorry, this is the Retail Innovation Lounge. My company is an advisory, but this is the thing I care about at CES, right? It's the Retail Innovation <laughs> Lounge. Um, so we're excited. You know, this is our first year to be invited in. We look forward to creating a home for those folks that are touching retailers and brands, whether they're agencies, retailers, brands themselves, tech companies, venture capitalists. You know, that's our audience. We look forward to uh, 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 being there and growing it into next year. So we'll be at the LBCC South Hall, uh, 30, booth 31600. So fantastic. Well, I want to thank all of you. This has been a really exciting conversation. I'm actually really excited about family tech and education tech just because I have an eight year old. So I'm always looking for things. And because I'm a tech geek myself, I, I love uh, discovering um, new things uh, for family life. Um, but to wrap it up, I want to thank our sponsor, um, Matt from Indiegogo, who um, is really powering, I think, uh, the future of enterprise innovation. I'm very excited to, um, to get to Eureka Park and check out what you're doing. And then also all of my other colleagues here who are um, all doing really exciting things. Um, my name is Lori Schwartz. We're StoryTech. We're giving executive tours at CES and so excited to tie together all these fabulous trends that will be the framework of the experience at CES. So thank you so much for joining and we'll be seeing you in January in Las Vegas. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.